Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, we are about to begin Lightning Talks 5. We have three Lightning Talks beginning at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our first will be compounding drugs data, developing a drug terms tool for knowledge synthesis projects using linked open data. Just a note before I introduce Tyler, uh, questions we'll have time for at the end, but feel free to put them in the Zoom chat or in the Slack, uh, and we will get to them at um, 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So at this point, um, please join me in welcoming Tyler Ostapik, liaison libra librarian for the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority Virtual Library at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada. He previously worked as a cataloging librarian and during that time developed an interest in Wikidata and linked open data. Thanks for the introduction. Hi everyone. As mentioned, I'm a health librarian at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada. And I'll be talking today about a tool I developed for generating drug terms for knowledge synthesis projects using linked open data. For this talk, I'm going to first provide some context for why I developed the tool. Next, I'll talk about how the tool works and the process it goes through. I'll then show you what the tool interface looks like. I'll discuss some challenges and barriers I've encountered, and then I think there will be time for a bit of a live demo. For some context, I thought there might be some people who aren't familiar with knowledge synthesis, so I would start there. The Canadian Institute of Health Research defines knowledge synthesis as the integration of research findings from various research, and they say the most common approach for knowledge synthesis has been systematic reviews. Systematic reviews are a type of knowledge synthesis that tries to bring together all available evidence on a research topic. And this generally means you need to develop a search strategy that is able to find everything that's been written out there on a subject. In my role as a health librarian, I support researchers in developing these types of searches. This is an example of a systematic review question that includes a pharmaceutical intervention or a drug, Tylenol. To ensure all of the available information is found on the subject, when developing a search, generally you want to identify all of the various synonyms and terms used for a drug. So for example, if you search for just Tylenol in a bibliographic database, you may miss articles if an article refers to Tylenol as acetaminophen or paracetamol. And usually the list of terms is created by manually consulting various thesauri, previously published literature, and experts or researchers in the field. This example here is an example of some of the various terms for Tylenol that would, you would maybe use in a search on this topic. And one day I was compiling one of these lists and I thought there must be a better way and that was sort of my impetus for developing a linked data drug term tool. So I developed the tool using Python. Right now I have it running in a virtual environment on my personal machine, but my hope is to eventually host it publicly. And briefly what the tool does is take a search term from an HTML form. It then goes out and queries various linked data sources for the term, including Wikidata. If there's a match, it retrieves the synonyms and unique identifiers. It then combines the retrieved synonyms or alt labels into a search string, and then outputs the search string onto an HTML results page. And then that search string can be copied and pasted into various bibliographic databases for finding relevant articles. This is what the interface currently looks like. It's very basic. I'd like to do some refining of the display and options, but so far I've just been focusing on getting the tool working. It allows the user to input a term for a specific drug, and it allows them to select from various data sources. And then the phrase search option adds quotation marks around each term in the list, which can be useful when searching certain bibliographic databases. This is an example of the results page for the term ibuprofen after querying all of the sources except for PubChem. So the tool will let you know if you didn't select a particular source or if there are no results found in a source. 
if it finds the term in a source, it provides a link out to that source using the term's unique ID. So you can see the links out here to MeshRDF as well as Wikidata. And the search string at the bottom there can be copied and pasted into bibliographic databases for searching for articles. This is an example of the generated search string for ibuprofen being used in Ovid Medline. And you can see that this has retrieved about 400 additional articles compared to just searching for the term ibuprofen. That sort of covers where I'm currently at with the tool. <clears throat> I've encountered a few challenges with the tool so far. One of these has been restricted access for certain APIs. So mTree is an authoritative thesaurus for drug terms, but the API is pay to access, so I haven't been able to incorporate that source, unfortunately. I'm also using a static Excel file for drug bank, which isn't ideal, but it's because they don't allow use of their API for the development of these types of tools. I also had quite a bit of trouble formatting the responses from the various sources in a way that was acceptable to bibliographic databases because they can be quite particular. Some of the retrieved terms contained odd characters, diacritics, or parentheses, and certain bibliographic databases also use certain terms or abbreviations as operators, such as and or or, or to search for certain things, like PT is used to search for publication types. So I had to write some Python code that would go through the results and strip out all of those problematic characters after I'd retrieved the set of results. And lastly, I developed this tool with the idea of making searching for pharmaceutical interventions easier, but I'm not sure whether it's as effective as creating the search strings manually. It's certainly faster, but I would like to conduct a study to compare the results generated by the tool to manually generated results to evaluate how effective it really is. And now I think I can spend some time demoing the tool. So like I said, the interface is very basic, but we can put a drug term in here, such as naproxen, and then we can select all data sources and then click search. So it's going out and querying all five of these data sources for the term naproxen. And you can see here that we have the links out so if I click on this, it will bring me to the mesh RDF. If I Hi, Tyler, on... just to interrupt, I think oh, we're just seeing sure. a slide that says live demo. Oh, okay. Uh, let me try resharing my screen. Sorry about that. Thanks for letting me know. Problem. Is that better? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I must have just shared the slides instead of my whole screen. I'll just go through the process again here. Yeah, so this is what it looks like. We can put a drug term in and then select our data sources and then click search. And then we have all of the links out here. So for example, the mesh RDF for naproxen or the Wikidata entry for naproxen. And then at the bottom here is our giant search string of all of the alt labels and synonyms for the drug. So what a searcher would do is take that search string and then paste it into a bibliographic database, which I've already done because it takes a while to generate the results sometimes. So I thought I'd do it ahead of time. And you can see for naproxen here, if you just searched naproxen, it retrieves 7,000 approximately articles, but all of these terms together retrieve 72,000 articles. Now, I don't know if all of these would be relevant, but it definitely shows you that there could be articles that would be missed if you're just searching for the single term, and you don't have to spend time manually generating the string using the tool. So like I said, I'd like to do some more evaluating of it to see how effective it is, but that's how it currently works. And I'll just demonstrate quickly that if we type in, say, a random string of characters, it still goes out and searches but it will let us know that it doesn't find any results in this case. There we go. And same thing if we only select a few, a couple of sources. 
it will let us know that we didn't search these specific sources. So our string is shorter in this case. And that's basically the tool. I'm happy to answer any questions after the other presentations. And I'd also be happy to hear suggestions for other linked data sources I could incorporate, especially if they're related to drug information. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Tyler. Again, we're gonna do questions at the end. So I will introduce our next presenter now, Ernesto Cuba and feel free to put your slides up. Ernesto Cuba is a postdoctoral associate at the University of Washington School of Information. He holds a PhD in Hispanic linguistics from the City University of New York. His research area is language, gender, and sexuality in Spanish-speaking communities. Welcome, Ernesto. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm Ernesto. In this lightning talk, I will present the ongoing implementation of the Spanish Homosaurus Project, an international link open data vocabulary of Spanish LGBTQ terms that supports improved access to LGBTQ plus resources within cultural heritage institutions, such as uh, libraries, archives, and museums worldwide. The Spanish Homo Soros is further situated within the landscape of multi-language description and the efforts to move beyond the monolingualism and anglocentrism of library and information status practice. Um, the project has been funded by a grant from the National Endowment of, for the Humanities for three years. In year one, the Spanish language Homo Soros team translated the English language Homo Soros whose first uh, version dates back to 2013. During year two, the team is developing new Spanish terms and adding them to the Spanish language homo source. Finally, in year three, in the future, <laughs> the Spanish language homo source will be implemented and tested with partner institutions. In brief, in this brief talk, uh, first I will bring a summary of years one's in year one's activities. And in more detail, I will present the ongoing activities of the current second phase of the project. Um, year one focus on the Spanish language vocabulary development through one-to-one -one translation. Over 3,000 uh, terms in the English language homosaurus were translated to Spanish by a team of three Northeastern University undergraduate students. You can see their names in the screen under the supervision of the copy KJ Rosso. Uh, the team spent over eight months translating terms, scope notes, and alternate labels while doing extensive research on their usage, evolution, and regional significance. <clears throat> uh, regional significance in Spanish-speaking countries. Some decision points made by the team were using X as a gender neutral ending, like in the word Latinx, uh, so the gender neutral language, as you may know, Spanish language uh, has this phenomenon, this phenomenon called grammatical gender, something that is completely foreign to the English language, uh, where nouns has to be, you know, separated in two types, uh, feminine, quote unquote, grammatical gender, and masculine, quote unquote, grammatical gender. So to avoid this androcentric bias or binary structure, uh, some uh, linguistic activists have, have, uh, have been promoting the X as a possibility to overcome or to fight against this uh, uh, gendering of the Spanish language. Uh, also, they noticed that uh, they, they um, proposed to keep the spelling of original English terms when the direct translation to Spanish was impossible. So the word king uh, is a very um, it's difficult, super difficult to translate the Spanish. And uh, actually, the, in the communities of king practitioners in the Spanish Spanish speaking communities, it's very common just to adopt the English look word, uh, the English term as a, um, yeah, as um, directly from Spanish to from English to Spanish. This initial version of the Spanish vocabulary has been reviewed by Anna Pornoy Bremer 
a professional translator, and Ernesto Cuba, me, <laughs> a social linguist, are as a postdoctoral fellow uh, at the University of Washington under copy I, Marika Sifor, for the School of Information. The translation work has, was done with a high degree of care and precision, far beyond a simple translation of a label from English to Spanish. Um, while there are concepts in English labels that has been reasonably, reasonably straightforward Spanish equivalents, uh, such as bisexuality and lesbian cinema, others could not be translated directly due to lack of linguistic and cultural counterparts in Spanish. And um, this is the case of many, many new pronouns in English, like se, <laughs> you can see. Uh, complementarily, uh, the complementarily, the team received critical feedback from our institu institutional partners, the Spanish Homo Soros Advisory Board, the Homo Soros Editorial Board, as well as from the broader Homo Soros user community. And on August 8th through 9th of this year, the UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center, one of the Spanish Homo Soros partner institutions, hosted the first Spanish Homo Soros Summit. Uh, the event brought together members of the whole Spanish Homo Soros team, lead collaborator of the three partners institutions, uh, the Chicano Studies Research Center, San Francisco Public Library, Arizona First Archive. And along with over 25 people, including community partners, librarians, archivists, archivists sorry, faculty and students to learn about and contribute to the Spanish Homo Soros project. So you can see our smiley faces in the picture. I over there, Marika Sifor is in the middle, uh, in the back. Uh, KJ is seated in the on the on the, on the left. <clears throat> so um, so year two focuses on the addition of culturally and linguistically specific vocabulary to the Spanish language Homo Soros from the collections located in the three partner sites. Uh, while year one built a strong foundation for Spanish language Homo Soros, it would be highly imprecise to base the entire Spanish vocabulary on translations of already existing English terms for two reasons. First, it would be inaccurate to assume that all LGBTQ plus related concepts in Spanish are expressible in English. Second, using English as the sole basis for the Spanish Homo Soros would be a form of cultural imperialism, <clears throat> of cultural imperialism that further centralizes the English speaking right. world. These new terms are based on community preferred colloquial language yeah. employed across Latin America and US based Latinx communities. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, I was reading the chat, sorry. So this phase is led by me, Ernesto, with expertise in social linguistic, Hispanic dialectology and LGBTQ plus lexicography in close collaboration with the Spanish Homo Soros partner institutions. Concretely, uh, I will carry out collection-based research in the three partners archive and libraries. The development of new terms will involve research and on regional views such as creation of term relationships and incorporation of vernacular synonyms to fully build out Spanish language scope notes, uh, history notes, yeah. and hierarchical yeah. relationships among terms. <clears throat> uh, so my first visit will take place in January 2025 in Arizona. My former research on LGBTQ plus uh, lexicography allows me to anticipate some results. I took this picture uh, during, in August, during my visit to, during the first Spanish Homo Soros Summit, the suggested male presenting figure lying on a car is surrounded by the Spanish word maricón, an epithet targeting feminine, presumably homosexual men. I, I hypothesize that maricón is the most widespread label to prefer gay men in the Spanish speaking world, that is in Spain and the uh, 19 predominantly Spanish-speaking countries in Latin America. <clears throat> Simultaneously, each country holds its preferred local way to refer or insult gay men. This lexical profusion is challenging when including new terms in the Spanish Homo Soros. For example, there is a risk of linguistically overrepresenting gay men over other sexual and gender identities, such as lesbians. Moreover, the cultural differences among terms belonging to the lexical field of maricón should not be glossed over. 
In other words, it is misleading to think that these terms are entirely equivalent. <clears throat> oh, sorry. I hope that this lightning talk could spark some interest in the working progress of the Spanish language homo service. Gracias. Thank you so much, Ernesto. We will be doing questions and conversation at the end. So next, I would like to introduce uh, our third lightning talk for today. Joseph, feel free to share your slides when you are ready. So Joseph Dudley is a member of the system librarian team at Bryant and Stratton College, remotely providing reference assistance and digital technical services to students and faculty in Western New York, Ohio, and Wisconsin. He has also been an active contributor to the Homosaurus Term Selection Group for the last year after hearing a panel presentation about it at LD4 2023. Okay, just one moment until I find my slides um, and then I'll get started. In the meantime, if uh, anyone wants to post questions for the previous two lightning talks in the Slack or in the chat here in Zoom, we will get to those after Joseph. Okay. Pardon me for um, lagging here. I thought I had this under control. No problem. I think we have uh, time. We've been moving pretty quickly. Okay. Kelly, could you grab my slides from um, SCED? I'm just having a hard time finding them. Everything was running perfectly, and now I can't find the... Yeah, I will get on that. I have a PDF. Yes. That would be perfect. Okay, just one moment. Do you want to uh, stop sharing and I can share my screen? Okay, sure. Um, oh, everything looks different today. And I, um, I'm just not seeing things the way I saw them before. I think actually yeah. I can get the PDF up. I'm seeing it now. Do you see it? Yep. Okay, fantastic. Um, well, again, everyone, please forgive me for that um, little bump in the virtual road. Um, next slide, please, Kelly. Okay, the first thing to know about the Homosaurus is that it's an international controlled vocabulary expressed as linked data and designed to supplement broad subject term vocabularies, um, diplomatically we can say such as LCSH, but really it's LCSH, um, which may at times contain outdated subject terms, which can be outright harmful and um, cause trouble in locating current resources. And the vocabulary has been created by an international group of queer and trans information professionals um, because we can basically describe ourselves better than mainstream, mainstream society can uh, describe us and understand the complexity 
of both um, maintaining and updating such a vocabulary for the LGBTQ plus community. Um, it's a multilingual resource available currently in English, Spanish, as we just heard from Ernesto, um, French, Swedish, Hindi, and Bengali, but um, language development is ongoing. Um, also, term development is ongoing, and the editorial board releases semi-annual updates in December and in June with new terms, relationships, and updated preferred terms. Interested users for now may contribute to um, term selection and term discussion by submitting suggestions on the contact page on the Homosaurus website, but there will be a more robust term selection form available later this fall. And also users are encouraged to join the Homosaurus Google group at the link provided, and this is also available on the website. Next slide, please. Some brief history. Um, the vocabulary was originally created in the early 1980s by IHLIA LGBT Heritage, which was then known as Homodoc, to describe their own um, Dutch language LGBTQ plus collection in their database. In 1997, it was translated into English and became known as the Queer Thesaurus. And in 2013, Jack Vanderwell and Ellen Greenblatt did a major edit of the vocabulary. And um, this is when it became the first version of the Homosaurus um, and presented this at LGBTQ ALMS conferences, which basically introduced it in a new way to the global um, LGBTQ cultural heritage community and it began to be used more. Um, it's important to note though, at this time, the Homosaurus was still an offline document being distributed either as a Word document or as a PDF. Um, in 2015, K.J. Rawson, who is the director of the trend, uh, Digital Transgender Archive, collaborated with Vanderwell to transform the Homosaurus, start transforming the Homosaurus into a linked data resource. And in 2016, Rawson and Vanderwell established an editorial board to basically oversee and manage a second major edit of the, um, of the vocabulary. Then in 2019, the Homosaurus was released as a fully linked data resource. Next slide, please. While um, LCSH basically is slow to update and as, as I said, inhibit um, access to resources, a supplemental community created vocabulary such as Homosaurus is able to provide more relevant and accurate subject terms more quickly. Um, Link data becomes then recognized as the technology capable of providing such subject terms um, quickly in an automated, easily updated format. And this is important because we see um, a meeting of cultural heritage, humanities, and um, linked data at this point. Next slide, please. It's then the linked data character of the current version of the Homosaurus that's made it an internationally significant resource by enabling um, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums to both describe their LGBTQ plus resources using a standardized community selected, again, 
um, community selection is important, subject term vocabulary, and also link back to the updated terms and supporting scope notes. Linked data um, work is maintained by the Digital Transgender Archive using solar to display records, Postgres to store data and preservation metadata and blaze graph for querying. And as of 2019, the Homosaurus has been approved by the Library of Congress for use in MARC bibliographic records. Due to this sudden high level of accessibility, relatively sudden, use has grown dramatically worldwide um, to at least 50 cultural heritage institutions over 11 countries, those being Australia, Canada, England, France, Germany, Hungary, Ireland, the Netherlands, Spain, Sweden, and the US. Now, as um, impressive as this may be, it may also be underreported because many institutions don't publish their metadata standards. So the Homosaurus is actually, um, the editorial board is actually encouraging um, institutions who make use of the vocabulary to get in touch and um, let them know. Next slide, please. Here's a screenshot from the uh, documentation and implementation guide for the Homosaurus, demonstrating if you look at the lower part of the screen, how the terms can actually be used in MARC records, both in the uh, MARC 650 field, which will of course use the term as a subject term when there is an exact match to LCSH and the 655 field, which will allow the term to be used as a genre term um, when there is not an exact match. Next slide, please. And on this last slide are my list of works consulted. Um, I, I recommend these to you if you'd like to know more about the Homosaurus and um, the slides of course are available in PDF format on SCED if you would like to take a closer look at the slides. And that's all I have for you and I'll be happy to answer any questions. And Kelly, thank you for running the slides. No problem, glad that worked out. Thank you, Joseph. Okay. So at this point, we do have um, 15 minutes or so, um, depending on how long it takes to get through these questions, uh, to go through questions for our Lightning Talk presenters. So we have a few already, but if you have a question to ask, please post it in the Zoom chat or on the Slack, or go ahead and just raise your hand and we'll get to you. Um, thank you to my co-host, Jace, for transcribing in the Slack. I will start with the first, I think Ernesto may have answered some of these, but let's go through them anyway. Um, the first question how for, for Ernesto, uh, how do you do the evaluation of the translated terms? How do you plan to align the homosaurus with other Spanish linked open data? Is the translation entirely done manually? Do you see anywhere that this translation can be automated? Hi, um, so I turn off my camera because it's getting slow. So uh, there was there is not any single automatic what made it uh, processing in this project. Every was, everything was done by hand. Uh, we have been working with rounds of translations and revisions. Nothing is automated. Okay, great. Uh, then I asked a question to Tyler, which was that um, if you were using Flask to build the Python app and Tyler responded that yes, it's a Flask app. Yeah, I'll just mention that Python is very new to me. I just basically figured out how to do things by Googling and Flask seemed like a good choice. I'm still trying to figure out how to put it on a server and make it public versus just having it on my machine. So I mean, yeah, just getting it on. working is exciting. 
<laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, but yeah, Flask has a lot of documentation available, so it's it's uh, it's a good option for if you're trying to do something like that. Okay, question for Joseph. There are links to LCSH, and we know that these terms by LCSH can be influenced by the politicians. How do you plan to maintain these links? Do you see potential issues with such links? Um, that's an interesting question. Yes. And um, the issues are ongoing, but I think that the um, the editorial board is, you know, the editorial board is cognizant of these. And I think that's why, you know, there's new versions released twice a year to kind of, you know, to kind of meet those issues, those political issues. Because again, um, the the only way to, you know, the or one of the best ways to combat um, faulty description is by providing good description. So the work of the board and the work of everyone involved um, meets that political problem, I think. Okay, the next question is for Ernesto. For catalogers adding the Spanish homosaurus terms that have English equivalents, is it recommended to link the Spanish and English headings or keep them separate? Hi, so I just asked, well, first of all, I'm not so, someone in the implementation phase of the project. So I'm more, I'm, my work here is a specialist in Spanish language and LGBTQ plus uh, terminology and issues. Uh, so I asked my PI, uh, that is a very good question, she said. Uh, that is a question we need to take on in implementation guidance. Uh, the terms, regardless of language, will be linked within the Homo Solus by unique identifier. Mm -hmm. So all terms uh, that represent the same concept in the language will have the same unique identifier. Yeah, I don't know if that answered the question. I wish I can say more. But my skills go just to a, to a point, yeah. Thank you. The next question is for Joseph. A silly question. I noticed that Homosaurus is no longer a linked open vocabulary, but a linked data vocabulary. Why this change? That is a question actually that would um, I need to pass on to the director. And um, if you would like to contact me in Slack, we can exchange email addresses and I can get an answer to you after I hear back from him on that. I think the next question is for Ernesto. Following Yuzu's comment for Ernesto, I think which was about translation, uh, how do you plan to deal with the difference between the English and Spanish translations? There could be minor differences that leads to a not perfect match between the English term and your Spanish translation, right? Okay, uh, so this is a question. Uh, Okay, I think that, so I talk a lot, a lot about translation in my talk, uh, in this lightning talk. Um, there is going to be a moment in the homosaurus, uh, Spanish homosaurus, where we want to like, leave behind this idea of translation because we want to work only in Spanish terminology. So, again, the concepts are going to get uh, the identifier. Uh, it will link to different languages. Like currently the Homo Saurus is working with different languages. There are people in Canada working with the French and some other countries and languages. So uh, we're going to turn the page and just thinking in terms of more like the other question, I think somebody asked about, you know, how do we do with, you know, all these synonyms in the Spanish language we want to work with? the other possibilities, lexical choices as alternat uh, alternative labels. Um, so yeah, that, that, that is the 
specificity of the Spanish language is that there is a lot of variation because it's spoken in many, many uh, countries. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I think I have come to the end of the questions that have been asked so far, but we do still have a few minutes. If there are more questions for any of our lightning talk presenters, please either raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask or enter them in either the chat in the Slack or the chat here in Zoom. We have another question for jo uh, for Joseph. Do you plan to update the Sparkle endpoint? Yes, everything is um, constantly under development. That um, you know was one point that was made. You know, yeah, there will be updates. Updates are continual. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Ernesto, if you'd like to share your screen, go right ahead. Give me a sec, I'm, I'm loading my image. So just to have like a quick idea how uh, it's going to look. Um, give me a sec. So currently there are different teams uh, from different institutions working with this idea of creating uh, its own LGBTQ plus vocabulary based on the English version uh, that I was discussing. Uh, so you can see for a work camp, which is this uh, uh, satire of non kind of aesthetics very related with gay men. You can see the identifier, which is a code that will uh, be used to any of the languages. The preferred label, which is uh, kind of in the top of the hierarchy. Alternative labels are, in this case, camp. There, there is no alternative label, so it repeats. But for this Spanish language, for instance, for maricón, as I said, in alternative labels, I, and this is my thought, um, is going to appear the other national equivalents that appear in other countries. Like, you know, there are some terms that are not used in other places in Latin America or in Spain. And so once implemented, uh, the borough that said English will have like the term, I mean, the, the word Spanish, and then you can see the equivalents and how we've been working with uh, the Spanish system. Yeah. So it's simultaneously, uh, the platform is, is going to support and it's currently supporting different languages besides the English, of course. So that, that, that is how it will look like. Um, so I, uh, I anticipated that for alternative labels, for, the, for instance, the way to refer to gay men in Spanish, there's going to be at least a dozen of other terms in Spanish. So. Then is where this discussion on terms of translation it makes very much no much sense because we are talking within the language and in the own and its own uh, lexical variation, geographical variation. So, like one thing is like Great, yeah. Language is so complicated. As anyone who works, <laughs> anyone who works with these kinds of records knows. So that's really great work that you're doing. I think there is a question from Shuai. Uh, so basically, we're using uh, spreadsheets. Uh, so we are, again, uh, doing an iterative process of reviewing with native speakers of English, uh, uh, sorry, of Spanish bilingual people, like myself, like a professional translator, like these three amazing undergrad students. So we are coming and going you know, from one question to the other. And also we are getting feedback from people from the board and people from the Spanish uh, language homosexuals community. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's special. It's not very much sophisticated like that. I think we could do, uh, we have time for one more question. If anyone, um would like to put one in the chat. 
or raise your hand. Okay, um, thank you so much to our Lightning Talk presenters today, um, Tyler, Ernesto, and Joseph. At this point, we there is a break in the conference. Uh, I think the conference will start again in about an hour and 15 minutes, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for putting it together lessons learned from implementation of the DS 2.0 project for the Digital Scriptorium catalog. That will be in a different Zoom. This Zoom will end uh, in about 15 minutes at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Again, thank you so much to our presenters today. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>